as we get older, you can typically have what's called calcification of the pineal gland, which means that that gland that's releasing melatonin doesn't work as well anymore. As a consequence, they tend to have a flatter overall curve of melatonin release throughout the night. It's not this beautiful, lovely peak and this bullhorn message of it's darkness, please get to sleep. Frame for us melatonin in the context of its naturally occurring form. And then yeah. I'd like to talk about melatonin, the supplement, because as in my experience, anytime I say the word melatonin, people think about the supplement melatonin, which right. in itself is an interesting um, uh, phenomenon that people are so cued to its role as something you take, we often forget that this is something that we make endogenously. I'd love for you to comment in particular on even though we, without necessarily getting into its precise nanograms per deciliter values, what are the typical amounts of melatonin that we release each night? And then I'd like to compare that to what is contained in say a three milligram or six milligram tablet that one might buy at the pharmacy. Right. Yeah. So I go to sleep at night, has melatonin already kicked in before I shut my eyes and lay down my head? Usually, yes. Uh -huh. If your system is working in the correct way, as dusk is starting to happen, so let's say that you look at hunter-gatherer tribes who aren't touched by electricity, and so they're sort of the puritanical state par excellence when it comes to electric uh, light influence. Um, and usually it's as dusk is approaching, that's when melatonin will start to rise. And so when you lose the brake pedal of light coming through the eyes, that normally acts like a hard brake pedal that stamps down and prevents the release and production of, of melatonin. As that light brake pedal starts to fade with dusk, then we ease off the brake pedal and melatonin, the spigot of melatonin is opened up and melatonin starts getting released. And usually we'll see this rising peak of melatonin um, sometime, usually an hour, two hours later or around, and it varies from different people, around the time of sleep itself. But it's already been on the march for some hours before you actually hit sleep itself. Interesting. And uh, I was always taught, and I'm assuming it's still true, that the only source of melatonin in the brain and body is the pineal gland. Is that... Still true? It, yeah, no. it seems to be from best that we can tell. Uh, and the pineal gland, um, sort of meaning pea-like sort of uh, shape. It's actually, I think usually people say it's pea-like. I think if you look at the Latin derivative, it's more, um, I think it's derived from pine cone, hmm. not pea. Because in fact, if you look at the pineal, it is more pine cone hmm. shaped and so it's aptly named. Any um, human brain I've ever dissected, or I confess I've dissected a lot because I teach neuroanatomy and have for years. Um, I, I love looking at the pineal. It's the one structure in the brain that's not on both sides. It's usually pretty yeah. easy to find. And it's pretty good size. It, it looks like a it looks like a pea. And yeah. it's, it's sitting right there. And it's remarkable that it releases this hormone, probably our entire lifespan, yep. and is inhibited by light. The um, So it, our pineal starts to release this into the general circulation. I have to imagine we have melatonin receptors in the brain and body. It's correct. So, uh -huh. yep. Essentially, your brain has a central master 24-hour clock called the suprachiasmatic nucleus that keeps internal time. Now, it's not a precise clock if left to its own devices, nothing that a Swiss clockmaker would be proud of. It runs a little bit long and laggy. It's like an American clock. Right? So, <laughs> there are a much, couple of good American watches, by the way. Hamiltons are very it's nice. It's very much but, like a bug. But we're not famous for our timekeeping or our punctuality for that matter, but the Swiss are. It's yeah. very, it, it's it's not quite Swiss-like, it's more Berkeley-like, which is very relaxed. Oh, you know, whatever. Um, so in most adults, the average adult, I should say, your biological clock normally runs a little bit long. It's about, um, about 24 hours and 13 minutes, I think was the last calculation. But the reason that we don't keep drifting forward in time and kind of running consistently, you know, more and later and later, 30 minutes by 30 minutes by 30 minutes each day is because your central brain clock is regulated by external things such as daylight and temperature, as well as food and activity. All of these are essentially different fingers that come along and on the wristwatch of the 24 hour clock, will pull the dial out and reset it each day to precisely 24 hours. And I make that point because it knows 24 hour time. 
but it needs to tell the rest of the brain and the body the 24 hour time as well. And one of the ways that it does this is by communicating a chemical signal of 24 hour nurse <laughs> of light and day using this hormone melatonin. And when it is at low levels or it's non-existent, it's communicating the message, it's daytime. And for us, diurnal species, it says it's time to be awake. Yet at nighttime, when dusk approaches and the brake comes off melatonin and we start to release it, then it signals to the rest of the brain and the body, look, it's dusk and it's nighttime. And for us, diurnal species, it's time to think about sleep. So melatonin essentially tells the brain and the body when it's day and when it's night. And with that, when it's time to sleep, when it's time to wake. And therefore, that's why melatonin helps with the timing of the onset of sleep. But it doesn't really help with the generation of sleep itself. And this is why we'll come on to what those studies of supplementation have taught us. So and it tells the rest of my brain and body, it's time to go to sleep. It, it perhaps even aids with the transition to sleep. But it's not going to, for instance, ensure the overall structure of sleep or um, it's not the conductor that's guiding the sleep orchestra, so to speak, throughout the entire night. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, more it's, like the, um, the, the people that essentially take you to your seat and sit you down and give you your program. Right, right? exactly. Okay. Yeah, right. sort of the, right. the, the, the far um, less sophisticated analogy I have is, um, you know, melatonin is like the starting official at the 100 meter race in the Olympics. That's a better analogy. It ca yeah. calls all of the, the sleep races to the line and it begins the great sleep race, uh, but it doesn't <laughs> participate in the race itself. That's a whole different set of brain chemicals and brain, and brain regions, which, then brings us on to perhaps the question of supplementation, which is, is it helpful for my sleep? Will I sleep longer? Will I sleep better? And if I am, what doses should I be taking? Sadly, the evidence in healthy adults who are not older age suggests that melatonin is not really particularly helpful as a sleep aid. I think there was a recent meta-analysis that demonstrated when um, it it looked at all of the different sleep parameters, melatonin and, and a meta-analysis for those not knowing what that is. It's a scientific sort of method that we use where we gather all the individual studies and we put them in a big bucket and we kind of do this kind of statistical fancy sleight of hand and we try to come up with a big picture of what all of those individual studies tell us. And what that meta-analysis told us is that melatonin will only increase total amount of sleep by 3.9 minutes on average. Minutes? Minutes. Not even percent. No, and it will only increase your sleep efficiency by 2.2%. So wow. it really- This is as-, as uh... They say in um, certain parts of California that it's weak sauce. It's a weak <laughs> sauce effect. It, the, the source is not strong. The force is not strong in, in, in this one. When it comes to a, a tool that in healthy people who are not of older age, it doesn't seem to be especially beneficial. Now, you know, results can vary. Everyone is different, of course. So we're talking about the average, the so-called sure. average human adult here. Well, melatonin, um, in defense of what you're saying, and also I should mention, I have a colleague at Stanford, uh, Jamie Zeitzer. Who oh, you know, wonderful. Comes Chuck Jamie's Zeitzer's lab at Harvard Med, where brilliant. he also trained a terrific sleep researcher. And I asked him about melatonin, and he essentially said the same thing that you just said, which is very little, if any, evidence that it can improve sleep. And yet it's probably the most um, commonly consumed so-called sleep aid. Hundreds of million um, dollars industry. Yeah, so it ma either massive placebo effect or it's operating through some other mechanism related to quelling anxiety perhaps. Well, it, yeah, that is actually interesting. You know, there are some studies where you do see some, you know, effects. Now, again, when you do the grand average of all studies, it just doesn't seem to have an effect. But let's assume that for some people it does have an effect. Let's not, again, be sort of completely dismissive of that. How could it have that effect? One of the reasons that I've become a little bit more bullish on on melatonin from a sleep perspective and then melatonin more generally for a, uh, maybe we can speak about this too, as a counter measure un when you're undergoing insufficient sleep. Um, there are two, al two different routes there. The first reason that I think it could have a sleep benefit for some people is not because it helps in the generation of sleep. We know that it doesn't. It's because it too seems to drop core body temperature. Mm. 
There it is. And temperature so, again. I'm I'm fascinated these days more and more by temperature as um, maybe not just a ref, a reflection of brain state and wakefulness and in sleep, but actually a lever that uh, is quite powerful. I and, think it's both. And with all the interest in ice baths and hot showers and saunas and stuff, something that we will definitely touch on. Um, temperature variation is so key. So if, if melatonin is dropping body temperature by a degree or so, something that you've said before can help induce a sleepy state, uh, maybe that's what's allowing people to get in. I think in that's one possibility. I, I don't think melatonin by itself will drop it by sort of, you know, uh, a, a degree, certainly not a degree Celsius. And for order in us to fall asleep and then stay asleep across the night, we do need to drop our core body temperature by about one degree Celsius or about two to three degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And that's why it's always easier to fall asleep in a room that's too cold than too hot. Um, I think that that's one potential avenue that we are considering thinking more deeply about when it comes to melatonin. And then the other is melatonin as an antioxidant. But let's I, let me table that for now because I'll just get us sidetracked. That's what we know so far about melatonin in terms of its supplementation benefit or lack thereof two final points that I shouldn't forget. One is the only population where we typically see some benefit and it often is prescribed is in older adults. Because as older we, meaning um, 60 and older? Yeah, 60, 65 and older. Because as we get older, you can typically have what's called calcification of the pineal gland, which means that that gland that's releasing melatonin doesn't work as well anymore. As a consequence, they tend to have a flatter overall curve of melatonin release throughout the night. It's not this beautiful, lovely peak and this bullhorn message of it's darkness, please get to sleep. That's why older adults can have problems falling asleep or staying asleep. It's not the only reason by sure. any stretch of the imagination, but it's one of the reasons and it's why melatonin supplementation in those cohorts, older adults, and especially older adults with insomnia, people have thought about that as maybe an appropriate use case. Well, on those lines, um, if we were to compare dosages, uh, I don't, or do we know how much melatonin is typically released into the bloodstream per night? Um, and can we use that as a kind of a rule of thumb by which to compare the typical amount that someone would supplement? I yeah. mean, typically the supplements for melatonin that I see uh, in the pharmacy and elsewhere and online range anywhere from one milligram to 12 or even 20 milligrams. Yep. My guess is that a normal night's release of melatonin, typical for somebody in their 20s, 30s, 40s, would be far lower than that. Am it's, I correct or wrong? Yeah, yeah. it's it's at many magnitudes lower, and this is one of the problems. Is that I see that too. I see, you know, typical doses are you know five milligrams or ten milligrams, and of course, you know, if you're a supplement company, you know, putting ten milligrams versus five milligrams, if that's what you're actually doing, which we'll speak about purity as well. Um, it, you know, it, it's kind of like the super gulp size. You know, nobody wants to lower price. They just want you to, you know, we'll just give you more for the same price and that's how we'll compete. So it's been this escalating arms race of melatonin concentration. Mm -hmm. And it really does not look meaningful for, you know, for sleep in any way. What we've actually found is that the optimal doses for where you do get sleep benefits in the populations that we've looked at are somewhere between 0 0.1 and 0 0.3 milligrams of melatonin. In other words, the typical doses are usually 10 times, 20 times, maybe more than what your body would naturally expect. And this is what we call a supra physiological dose. In other words, it's far above what is physiologically normal. You know, and to put that in context, imagine I said to you, I want you to eat 20 times as much food today. I thought you were going to use testosterone as an example. Uh, you know, well, you're going to take 300 times the normal okay. amount of testosterone. We know that would have um, tons of deleterious effects. It would right. be terrible. Yeah. And yet you can do this. Well, one thing that I'm concerned about, about these supra physiological levels of melatonin, is that uh, many years ago, actually here at Berkeley, when I was a graduate student, we would inject animals, which were seasonally breeding animals, with melatonin. And the consequence of that was that their uh, gonads, either their testes or ovaries, would shrink many hundred, hundredfold or more. Um, in other words, that they would go from having um, nice, healthy-sized hamster 
testicles, what a hamster would consider healthy size um, for a hamster. And they would shrink to the size of a grain of rice. So from like an almonds to a grain size of a grain of rice. I had to see that only once for me to be very concerned about <laughs> super physiological <laughs> levels of melatonin. And I realized yeah. that melatonin does different things in different species. We are not hamsters. We are not right. seasonal breeders. Uh, seasonally restricted breeders. There might be more breeding during certain seasons. I don't know those data, but nonetheless, hormones are powerful. And yeah. the, and sure, there is an optimal. And sometimes uh, we see that going slightly above endogenous levels for certain hormones, not always, can have beneficial effects. And sometimes it can have detrimental effects. I'm just concerned about taking high levels of a hormone that has effects on the reproductive axis. And that's one of the reasons why I get very concerned when I see people really getting aggressive about melatonin supplementation, taking 100, 10, 500, sometimes even 10,000 times the amount that we would normally release. That's that's my concern, although it's not nested in any one specific human study. I just, right. I just don't like to see, I certainly don't wanna see other people and I don't wanna uh, personally take a hormone that's known to be androgen suppressive at high levels. Why would I? Why would I take that? I, that that's the I question I a, ask myself. I think yeah. it's a very yeah. you know good yeah. point. And if you look at some of the evidence around you know melatonin's lethality, if you want to go to that extreme, for the most part, you know it, it's pretty safe. The, the, it's, you mean it's, how, you can take a lot of it before you die? Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But that, I don't know that that's, that that's should not be that's your yardstick for no. because you know you really need to think about your you know your health, not just whether this sure. thing is going to, to kill you or not, yeah. as the decision matrix through which you pop, right. a, a, pop a pill. And it comes on to this concern around melatonin because there was a study, I think it's one that you mentioned too, where they looked at over, I think it was at least over 20 different brands of melatonin supplements. And what they found is that based on what it said on the bottle versus what was in the, the capsules themselves, it ranged from, I think it was 83% less than what it said on the bottle to 478% more than what it said on the bottle. Now, if you're, if that's a 10 milligram, you know, pill and it's 478% more than 10 milligrams and we're already at 10 milligrams at many tens of times more than is a physiological rather than a mm -hmm. supra physiological dose. Yeah. We do need to be a bit thoughtful. Yeah, remember so. those hamsters, folks. <laughs> uh, uh, well, and I do appreciate the deep dive on melatonin because I think people need to understand that it's it's nuanced. It's a matter of dosages and timing, et cetera. And then it may have its place, as you mentioned, in, in older individuals.